So welcome to this afternoon. The survivors, you're here. I'm really happy to see everyone here. Uh, and we're going to be talking about building reactive pipelines with Kotlin and Spring. Um, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a Spring developer and advocate. Here are my contact details. I'll provide them later on, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, but uh, as always, Twitter is the best way. <laughs> So, uh, how many of you have had your boss come to you at the beginning of a new year and said, hey, great job last year. Uh, I was wondering if you'd mind if we doubled your budget and you could like slow down your release cadence a little bit. Would you? Yeah, that never happens, right? <laughs> if that has happened to you, please do let me know because I'm collecting data for a study, right? Uh, no, that never happens. I mean, we're always asked to do more with less or at least more with the same amount of resources, right? Uh, which kind of brings us to why are we here this afternoon. Um, we're going to talk first about scaling systems and traditional approaches uh, a little bit. I'm going to try to move through this fairly quickly so we can get right to the code because everything I, what I like to do is dive into the code so you can see kind of where it all comes together. That said, I think context is important. Uh, anytime I've just gone straight to code and skipped all the context, there are a lot of questions afterward that I feel like would have been answered by a little bit of like upfront talk, so that's why we're doing this in, in phases here. Uh, what do we do, though, with traditional scaling once we reach the limits? Where do we go from there? Uh, and then, okay, that sounds good, but how do we do that? How does it work? And that's where the code comes in. Uh, now, I want to say that there are limits to what I can cover in 45 minutes. So what I, I've done is kind of judiciously chosen some things, concentrating on the foundations, but building out from there, there are a couple of really cool sessions that I'd like to refer you to tomorrow, both tomorrow, 10.15 and 11.15. So that's uh, kind of nice, convenient. Um, Roman is going to be talking about asynchronous data streams with Kotlin Flow, which will kind of uh, probably carry on from what I have, am talking about a bit, uh, as well as Sebastian Delius, who uh, leads the, development, the Kotlin development in the Spring team. Uh, we'll be talking about some of the uh, some of the areas that we've already accomplished and conquered uh, with, with Kotlin in Spring. Spring is kind of a general umbrella term, right? When we talk about Spring, it's Spring Framework, is it Spring Boot, is it Spring Data, is it yeah, several other things. Uh, so so it's, a, it's got a lot of surface area. So uh, he'll talk about kind of where we are with things and uh, where things are headed as well. Uh, but those are both going to be excellent talks. I would highly suggest going to those. And they will build out kind of from what I'm talking about today. Hopefully, probably. Uh, so who am I? A little bit about me, what makes me semi-sort of so pseudo almost qualified to talk about this stuff. Uh, my name is Mark Heckler again. Uh, I've co-authored a couple of books. I've contributed content and code to several other books, some of which even recognize my contributions. <laughs> that was nice. Um, the others, don't buy those, please. Um, I am an architect and developer, and as you might surmise from the next point where most of my expertise has been won, it's been in the uh, JVM ecosystem. Uh, I am a Java champion, a Java One Rockstar, Groundbreaker Ambassador, and a few other honors and awards which I truly appreciate, but still result in me having to buy my own coffee. I don't know who to see about that, but anyway. Uh, I am a professional problem solver. That's not my official title. It's just what I do, as do you. That's why we're here, right? Uh, I am a Spring developer and advocate. Uh, I develop apps with Spring. I actually contribute code to Spring, and I like to talk about that. So uh, after my wife, my, the two favorite things in the world for me to do are write code and talk about writing code, right? Uh, wife comes first. She's told me she's going to be watching this online. You're, you've got all this, right? Good. Okay, good. Check that box. <laughs> uh, I am also the sole creator and curator of Spring Noticias en Español. So, si eres hispanohablante, háblame, talk to me. Uh, if you don't speak Spanish, that's fine. That's cool. Don't leave. Uh, if you do, if you have resources that you would like to share that are in Spanish, uh, I noticed a couple of years ago that, um, well, actually less than that, maybe a year, year and a half ago, uh, that uh, Spanish is the second most or fourth most, depending on who you listen to, uh, most spoken language in the world. And we didn't really have a lot of resources kind of collected and gathered and shared that, uh, for that. And I thought, hey, I can do something about that. That's an area I can contribute to. So if you have resources about Java, Kotlin, Spring, uh, Gradle, Maven, anything that we would all find interesting uh, in Spanish, let me know. Let me amplify your voice and share that with the community as well. All right. Uh, also, new book coming out. Um, I just signed onto a contract. I'm going to be working on this uh, first half of next year. It's, it's supposed to come out uh, August 1st. By the way, this is not the real cover. It's just a parody cover I put together online. Uh, I hope. <laughs> 
Hope they don't saddle me with this actual cover now. Uh, but the book is Spring Boot Up and Running, and it's not uh, up and walking or up and crawling. What I want to do is kind of take it uh, from an introductory perspective, but also go deeper uh, and talk about things like Spring Boot and Kotlin and, and uh, reactive programming and things like that. So um, due out uh, August 1st, like I said, uh, if you'd like to keep up with the announcements and just kind of progress, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> okay. Oh, I should mention also, by the way, before I go any further, there's another book. Actually, uh, my friend Ken Cousins has out, and it's out here. He's going to be doing a book signing tomorrow on, on uh, uh, Kotlin recipes, so catch on uh, to that. Uh, look for it. He's tweeted it, I think, uh, but noon tomorrow, so that's a, a chance to go get a, a book signed by the author and a, a smart guy and a really great guy as well. All right, um, so yeah, scaling systems. <sighs> a little bit of history. Again, I think it's important to have context. Uh, when most of us have monoliths in our organizations, have had and probably still have some, right? And there's nothing inherently wrong with a monolith. Uh, monoliths provide a lot of value for organizations. They still drive a lot of the economy, global economy. Uh, but the problem, or probably the primary problem with monoliths, are that they're one big unit of a lot of functionality, and that's problematic when it comes to scaling, right? Um, typically, you have a lot of different capabilities that a monolith provides, and not all of those capabilities are equally stressed at any given point in time. I like to think of a, an online retail app. So if you've done a good job with your company and your store and your app, you'll have a good product market fit, you'll have good quality products, you'll know your customers, and your customers will buy a lot of your products. They probably won't return many of them. You'll have a few returns, right? Wrong size sweater, you know, wrong color, whatever but you're not going to have nearly as many returns as you do sales. And yet, when your, your monolith is stressed from a lot of sales, what do you do when you need to scale that? You pick up the monolith and duplicate it, or triplicate it, or whatever. And the problem is that you bring a lot of baggage along with it that doesn't need to scale. So when we start really realizing that that's terribly inefficient, and there are a lot of other problems that go with that, but again, time, uh, we start looking for ways to better scale. And most of the time, we arrive at something like microservices, right? We tease out the functionality that needs to scale independently, that's more volatile, that needs to scale out and scale back in. And we can look at scaling that, which is better, right? But a monolith, or excuse me, a, a microservice doesn't equal a capability. In most cases, <clears throat> by the way, sorry about the voice. I'm, I've been fighting terrible um, head, chest, cold, and stuff. So I'm going to be leaning on the hot tea and hopefully not coughing frequently, but yeah, it's a little rough, pardon. Um, so with a microservice, with a, with a capability, you're not going to be providing that in most cases by a single microservice. You're going to be breaking out or teasing out a small cluster of microservices. For instance, on that aforementioned order service, uh, when someone places an order, that order service may check inventory with the inventory service. It may check your credit your account balance. It may check your shipping address and make sure it's a valid shipping address. So what you typically see is you have a number of services that are teased out to provide a capability, which is fine. But you start realizing that you're kind of still coupled in many ways. When you talk about scaling, you're scaling uh, clusters of microservices, typically kind of in a one-to-one -one fashion almost. Not always, but fairly close. Uh, and you're not isolating that out and it's scaling and decoupling to the extent you thought maybe you were going to. Enter messaging platforms. Messaging platforms allow you to decouple your services quite nicely. Uh, because if a service produces a message and pushes it into a pipeline, the receiving service may not even be available at the time that, that message hits the pipeline, right? Uh, you can have things like durable queues, you have retention, delivery guarantees. And when that, that receiver, that recipient comes online, the producer of that message may not even still be online. So you, you temporally decouple. You locationally decouple. A, a receiver of a message doesn't even know, need to know or care where that message came from. It just sees it as a message it needs to consume and process. So messaging platforms give you a lot of different capabilities, a lot of different uh, scaling options, a lot of different flexibilities, routing capabilities, because you can set up some pretty sophisticated routes in terms of messaging platforms that you really can't do in many other ways. Um, Spring Cloud Stream gives you a lot of capabilities in terms of uh, abstraction, 
really, boiling it down to one word. Because if you were able to standardize the whole world on one messaging platform, that would be wonderful, right? We'd all use Kafka, or we'd all use Rabbit, or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, you can't. Even if you standardize within your company on RabbitMQ, let's say, what happens when your partner that you work with is standardized on Kafka? Or maybe your company acquires or is acquired by another company that's using Kinesis, or what have you. So you, in many ways, need to have some level of abstraction to maximize your productivity, to maximize your business impact. It would be really nice to be able to do that and, as a developer, not have to get into the weeds every time we wanted to, to send messages back and forth or route messages in a sophisticated manner. And that's what Spring Cloud Stream gives you. Spring Cloud Stream is built on Spring Boot. Right? So you get the auto configuration, simplified deployment, and dependency management. Uh, it's also built on Spring integration. And we're extending, actually, and evolving the API and evolving the way things work. And I'll show you some of the cool stuff that we're doing now, uh, today. Uh, but it does give you kind of superpowers when it comes to your building uh, messaging platform pipelines. And by the way, I do try to keep it at that level, that term, pipelines, because whether we're dealing with exchanges and queues or topics, uh, most of the time, as developers, after the initial configuration, what do we need from a messaging platform? We need the ability to push messages to it and pull messages from it, to route them in some specific way. But at the higher level business value level, that's really what it boils down to. We need to be able to send and receive messages, right? Okay. Here's an example. I'm going to try to keep this fairly simple today because I want to have, obviously, time to explore the topics I want to explore. Um, and this is almost as simple as you can get it. So with Spring Cloud Stream, you have three built-in interfaces, a source, a processor, and a sync. Um, a source is the thing that produces values, right? A sync is the thing that consumes those values. End of line, done. In between, you may have one or more processors which take a value, manipulate it in some way, and pass it on. Uh, and you can get pretty, again, sophisticated with this and can combine it in different ways, have processors that feed more processors and sinks and what have you. Uh, the simplest example is a source and a sink, right? But this is almost that simple. Uh, and I want to uh, do something with this as we go. That's why I use all three. Now, this is kind of the terminology that has traditionally been used in legacy uh, Spring Cloud Stream. But we started realizing that there, it's a little bit of a leaky abstraction from Spring integration, right? We're, we're telling a little bit more than we necessarily need to do because these line up very nicely with, with basic constructs in Java and Kotlin, right? Uh, you have a supplier, which supplies values, a function which transforms values, and a consumer, which consumes values. And we started realizing that we could simplify this and, again, use auto configuration where it kind of enables you to do more with less effort, which is always nice. OK, so if we've redlined, looking at microservices and ways that, that we might uh, be able to extend our scaling in some way to, to better scale, uh, we need to kind of look at how to change our approach to, to look at new ways to scale. Uh, we've traditionally, in the JVM ecosystem, uh, I'd say bad old days, but I mean, it's been up till fairly recently, uh, you had, for each connection, you had an additional thread spun up, right? Uh, which tended to limit you. I mean, it wasn't so bad until you hit that N plus one threads. When you hit that N plus one thread, that thread was going to be waiting, right? That request was going to be waiting, I should say, uh, for something to free up. And most of the time, those threads were busy doing what? Nothing. They were blocking, waiting for a response from another service or a database call or what have you. Um, so we needed a way to, to work around that. Now, there are several options. You know, coroutines come to mind, right? Um, Project Loom if and when it ever happens, and I'm sure it will at some point, uh, but it's not here, and there's, right now there's a lot of, you know, kind of talk and debate. Uh, Project Reactor, uh, you have reactive programming, which has been worked on for several years as well. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more on that today, but again, doesn't invalidate the other options, and I'll show you some hints toward where we're headed with things like flow and coroutines as well. Um, and performance, because I, whether we're talking uh, coroutines, Loom, or Reactor, you need some way, or it would be nice to have some way to enhance your performance as well. So when you have three requests that take a minimum of a second apiece, and you're doing it in a blocking fashion, you know you're going to have a minimum of three seconds. But if you can execute them in parallel, you have a minimum of one second, right? So there are some performance gains to be had. Doesn't always apply, depending on whether you're I.O. or, or CPU bound. But uh, that's something that can be gained as well. 
Um, and of course, boiling it all down, if there was any synergy to be had with messaging platforms, that would be awesome too, <laughs> right? So, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking primarily about Reactor. Uh, I like to point this out because a lot of times folks aren't necessarily that familiar with reactive programming. This is a quote by one of our uh, Project Reactor team members, Rostin Stoyanchev. I stole it from him, and I shamelessly show it every time I give a talk like this, and I'm sure he doesn't like that, but uh, it's too bad. Uh, <laughs> In a nutshell, reactive programming is about non-blocking event-driven applications that scale with a small number of threads with back pressure as a key ingredient, and why? So our slower consumers aren't overwhelmed by faster producers. And that's very important because you have to be able to or you need to be able to push back when you have a slower consumer. In the old days of asynchronous programming, when you had no way to apply back pressure, what would happen if you had a slow consumer? It would typically just fall over when it was overwhelmed, right? We need some way to signal upstream that we can't handle that much. If you have a consumer that can handle 10 values per minute, then it requests 10. And then when it's ready and it's consumed those, it requests another 10 or what have you. So it, it keeps you from overwhelming those. It doesn't change the fact that your upstream producer may be producing 1,000 values per minute, but it does allow you to have that control where you may have it better in a cloud service versus on an iPhone client, you know, three countries away. All right. Uh, a little bit about their Active Streams API. There are four interfaces, a publisher, a subscriber, a subscription, and a processor. Uh, a publisher is a thing that produces values. A subscriber is a thing that consumes them, right? A subscription is just the contract entered into between subscriber and, and publisher. And then a subs uh, well, actually, yeah, a processor is, it incorporates both a subscriber and a uh, publisher because it'll accept a value, manipulate it, pass it on. In terms of synergies, we see a lot of parallels here. Uh, because Spring Cloud Stream offers sources slash suppliers, which correlate with publishers. They're the things that produce values, right? Uh, you have a subscriber, which correlates to a sync or a consumer on the Spring Cloud Stream side. A subscription is actually, that's, that is performed by the pipeline itself, that contract, really. Uh, and then a processor, a function in Spring Cloud Stream, correlates to a processor in Reactive Streams. Okay, so let's code. So that's not too bad, right? That gives me, I think, a time to get through things. Probably fine. Okay. So did anyone recognize that guy, Maurice Moss? IT crowd? No one? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> you had me worried. I thought I was in the wrong room. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't watched the IT crowd, it's an eight or 10-year-old show now out of the UK. Watch it. It's hilarious. It's a tragic comedy. You'll love it. You'll, you'll cry. It's all, it's all good. Okay. So we're going to start here. Uh, this is the Spring Initializer. It's your starting point for Spring Boot-based microservices on the web. You don't have to go here. You can uh, curl it. You can HTTP it. You can access it from your IDE. You can even hand code everything, but it's not the most productive use of your time, so I'd recommend you start here. I'm going to keep things fairly simple. Oh, and by the way, dark mode. Yeah, anyway. It's kind of nice. But uh, I'm going to keep things, again, fairly simple so I can concentrate on the, the core and then build out from there. Uh, we're going to create a Gradle project using Kotlin, of course. Uh, I'm going to change this to the hecklers because it doesn't work otherwise. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But we can, so why not? Uh, <laughs> and then I'm going to just bring in some dependencies here, our reactive web dependency, uh, and then Spring Cloud Stream. And then Spring Cloud Stream even tells you, look, if you want to deal with a messaging platform, uh, the way you do that is with binders, right? A binder will interact with your messaging platform so you can abstract above it. Uh, so it'll tell you, look, if you want to deal with a messaging platform, which you do because you've added Spring Cloud Stream dependency, uh, you also need to add a binder like Kafka or RabbitMQ. So we're going to do that. Uh, I'm going to add RabbitMQ and Kafka because I'm a hopeless optimist. And if we have time, we'll get to that as well. If not, then I have repos. Uh, and that, I think that should be good. So let's go ahead and generate that. Uh, let's put that on the desktop. Oh, I don't want to call that demo. That's pretty weak. So we're going to create three different services. We'll call this source. And just to speed things along here, we have a processor. And I'm going to create a sync. And then we'll go ahead and just open that up. Yes, there it is. Whew. OK, and I'll open that up in my favorite IDE, NetBeans. Ha, 
kidding. <laughs> I mean, what did you expect? Come on. <laughs> I'm not trying to diss NetBeans. NetBeans is an awesome IDE. You know, it has great spring support. It's a, not so great Kotlin support, but you know, it's not not bad. Um, Eclipse also is a um, well, Eclipse also is an IDE, but <laughs> hey, hey, not my favorite. Anyway, uh, okay, so just first, uh, just one little nicety here. Um, this is all Kotlin script in our Gradle file, which is kind of a nice little extra. Come on, update. Everybody's on Wi-Fi looking at cat photos, aren't they? Okay, well, this will happen eventually, so I'm going to go ahead and go. Trust that it will. We have our application properties. That's where we put our sensible defaults. And let's see, our application. There we go. So let's start there. Come on. Do, 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 do. Oh. There it is. OK, <laughs> we're in business. OK, well, I, will, I shan't be stressing Wi-Fi here today. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to keep this, again, fairly simple. I'm going to create a data class. And by the way, what, I have two talks that are kind of similar that I kind of veer in different directions on. Uh, the one talk I do with coffee as my example, and the other one I do with airline flying a lot, because I fly a lot, right? And I, I'm trying to always problem solve. I'm trying to make life better for me and everyone else who gets stuck in these aluminum cans flying through the air. But I realized that Denmark has a great coffee culture. So I'm actually going to bring over my coffee example because, hey, why not, right? Any coffee lovers here? Just a few. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, with this stuff that I've got, I've sadly been drinking hot green tea most of the time, which I like, but I've really been missing my coffee, so I'll have to come back and, and go crazy. But, but for now, we'll, we'll work on this. Um, so for an example, remember I said I wanted to do a source, a processor, and a sink. Uh, what I want to do is, is capture the process that happens all the way from a coffee farm to a, to a coffee shop, right? So at a coffee farm, you have beans. You go and buy the beans, and you ship them to a coffee roaster. So we're going to the coffee farm. We ship them from our source. We, we tell our, our coffee uh, roaster that, yes, here, here the beans come. Uh, when we get them at our coffee roaster, we sort them, we, we wash them, we roast them, and we package them, and then we send them on to our coffee shops. That's where the payoff is, right? That's where we drink them. Pardon me. Okay, so we're going to start off with our wholesale coffee, and that's here at our coffee farm. Now, I have just a couple properties. Again, keeping this simple, we have an ID... Uh, that's a string, and a name, which is also a string, right? Um, okay, now, if we're going to be pushing coffees to our coffee roaster, we could do that manually, right? But that sounds like an awful lot of work, and I'm kind of a lazy developer, so I'm just going to create a component, a generator, to do that for me. So this will be a class, we'll call this cleverly enough, coffee generator. Uh, and we're going to have a couple of things here. We're going to have some names of coffees. So we'll create a list of names. Uh, so let's see. Um, I, I hear there are a few good coffee names. What is it? Barreso? Is that right? Yes? Good. OK, good. Um, I'm, I'm taking your word for it. All right. And then uh, let's see. What was another one? Um, uh, what was it? Uh, oh. Hold on, I, I have a cheat sheet, because I, I knew I'd do this. Merrill, yeah, is that right? See, I need to get out more, I really do. And Peter Larson? These are supposed to be the either best or biggest, I don't remember. No comment. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, and in the interest of cultural exchange, uh, one, uh, a roaster from my hometown is called Caldi's Coffee. Caldi's Coffee, I can't even spell today. Caldi's coffee, we'll just say Caldi's, Caldi, that's good. So we have four different coffees that we're going to be providing on a random basis. Uh, in order to do that, we need to um, create a randomizer here, so we'll just do that. Uh, and then we're going to uh, create a fun here to generate, generate our values. So uh, we'll just do, uh, let's see, this will be uh, wholesale coffee, and we'll use UUID. Uh, random UUID, two string to get our ID, and then we'll just take our names and we'll grab the random.nextint 
and we'll take the uh, names dot oops dot size, and that will give us a random coffee on demand, right? So that's not bad. Now we need to push our coffees on demand to our pipeline. So I'm just going to create a configuration class, configuration class, uh, and that will be our coffee rower. I cannot type today. Okay, private val generator, and there we go. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, well, actually, let's see. Yeah, I'll create a bean, and this bean, let's see, fun, send coffee. Sounds like a plea for help, right? Now, uh, what we're doing is creating a supplier. And this is a supplier, we could do a supplier of wholesale coffees, right? But that isn't very reactive. And again, we're gonna be talking reactive. Now, I should have mentioned, and I kind of skipped over this, uh, you have a publisher, which is the thing that produces values. But in the reactive world, in the non-reactive world, you have, let's say, a method call or a function call. It can return what? It can return an object of type T, or a, an iterable, a collection of some form of type T, so one or many, right? It made sense to split publishers into this, this, these concepts as well. So uh, for something that would return a value, it's a mono, right? Zero or one values, that's a mono, a publisher that will return zero or one items, objects. Uh, and then you have a flux, which can return zero to n. That may be a small collection, it may be an indefinite number of items over an indeterminate amount of time. So we're going to return a flux, flux of wholesale coffees. And now it starts to get a little more interesting, right? Uh, so equals supplier, and I want to show you something else here momentarily. Uh, so with our supplier, we're going to uh, do a flux, flux.interval. We're going to create a duration of one second, and then we're going to map each of those pulses that comes out. We'll use our generator to generate a value. Now, that's OK. But again, remember, I mentioned back pressure. So if you have a slow consumer that can't keep up with our super speed of one per second, uh, we need to define what happens on back pressure. So you can set up a buffer, a certain buffer size. I'm just going to drop the intervening values because we only care about the now. But that depends, right? If you have a dashboard, you, dropping those values is fine. If you need a historical context, you need to save those for some, to some extent. So that's all right. Now, this is the current API. And this is an evolved API, right? So we're no longer annotating everything with stream listener and send twos and things like that. But here's kind of where things are headed, right? And I'm giving you a little bit of a peek here because we should be able to do something like this. And we will very soon. It's just in the works, right? Um, no software is finished software. So this is kind of a, a peek at where we're going as well as where we're eventually going. Uh, probably the short term, very short term versus short term, right? So this is coming soon as well. So not here yet. We'll go with that. All right. So the other thing I need to do is just assign a few, oops, assign a few values here. I'm going to set the server port equal zero for a Spring Boot app. That means that it uh, will choose a random port that's available and run on that so we don't get port conflicts. And then I'm going to define my bindings. Um, we have a, a channel, if you will, that we're setting up for a send coffee. Uh, this is a source, right? This is a supplier, so it has an output channel only. Uh, and we have the opportunity for multiple inputs and outputs. At this point, we only have one for this simple example, so we'll just leave it at zero. And we'll set our destination to a pipeline called processor. We also can define our binder here. And since we're starting off with Rabbit, we'll leave it at that. I'm also going to define a couple of Kafka um, properties so that if we do have time, we can go to those rather nicely and easily. Set my minimum partition count at four. Auto add partitions to true so we can go ahead and Spring Cloud Stream can create those partitions for us as well, which streamlines our work quite nicely as well. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and create our processor. We'll open that up, it gives me a chance to, oh. Good, it didn't take forever on that. So uh, let's go to our application properties, application. All right, now our processor is the transformer, right? So we, we will still be dealing with a data class of wholesale coffee with a val ID string and a val name string, right? 
But we also, we're going to be transforming this. So we're going to transform these wholesale coffees to retail coffees, right? And we also have another property here that we're going to keep track of, which is state, because we need to track what state each of these coffees goes out in. So we'll have an enum here we'll call state, and it'll either go out as it should, right? Whole bean, best flavor, freshest, or for the poor folks who have to travel, don't have a grinder, don't know any better, uh, we'll also ship out some ground coffee as well. If you don't have a grinder, get a grinder, okay? All right. All right, so next we're going to create a configuration class. This will be our coffee roaster. All right. Um, yeah, so we have a bean. Um, and actually, I want to once again create a bit of randomness here, sauce a little bit of randomness into things. Uh, and this bean will be our, um, let's see, process it. We'll call it process it. Uh, and this is a function, right? Function. Sweet. And we could, again, take a wholesale coffee, convert it to a retail coffee, but we're dealing with streams, so we'll take a flux of wholesale coffees and convert them to a flux of retail coffees. And there we go. So function, and let's see. So we have it, right? This is our flux coming in, and we'll map each value that comes in. Uh, so let's see. We can do this pretty simply. So retail coffee, uh, it, actually, yeah, so it.id, it.name, and then for that randomness, right? So if random next int, next int, not it, uh, two equals zero, because it's going to have two values, right? Whole bean or ground? Yep. So that would be whole bean, else uh, ground. Sweet. All right. So that's pretty good. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just add a little bit of visibility here. So introduce local variable, our coffee, nice. And then our coffee, there we go. OK, so now we can see what's going on. That's pretty good. So once again, server port, mm. server port 0, Spring Cloud Stream, Spring Cloud Stream bindings. Uh, in this case, it's process it, right? Uh, we have an input channel because this is a processor. And our destination is, once again, a pipeline called processor. In this case, we want to set the group as well. If we don't set the group, everybody gets their own copy of every message, which is a great way to implement what's called a fan out pattern. And if you need that, that's very important. But if you need to scale, you want them in the same com consumer group. That way, they're competing consumers. So if you have two or five or 10, they take turns, and they can process roughly that many times the number of messages coming in. And then, of course, we want to set our binder to rabbit, and then our Spring Cloud Stream bindings process it, output channel, destination, we'll call this sync, and our binder, once again, will be rabbit. And then for our Kafka settings for later, Uh, minimum partition count four. Okay, so that gets us set up for our processor. Let's go ahead now and create our sync, and then the fun will begin. Ah, so much better after that first one. There we go. Nice. Okay, now our processor has done what? It's taken wholesale coffees and, well, a flux, a stream of a reactive stream of wholesale coffees and converted them into a reactive stream, a publisher, if you will, of retail coffees. So all we care about at our sync is those retail coffees that are flying our way, right? So we create a return to creating our data class. This will be retail coffee, val ID string, typing string, val name, name, string, come on, string, val state, state. And then we have our enum class state, whole bean ground. OK, now to process this, once again, I'm just going to create a configuration class. Many ways to do this. I kind of like this approach. So this will be our coffee drinker. Nice. And we create a bean. And this will be a, uh, we'll just call this drink it. 
And this is a consumer of a flux of retail coffees. All right, equals consumer. And this is pretty simple, right? It.subscribe. And print line it. Nice. OK. So then we just go ahead and add our properties, server port 0, Spring Cloud Stream, binders, bindings, excuse me. And this will be drink it, input 0, destination, drink it. No, sorry, sync. <laughs> OK. Group, same thing. We'll go ahead and set our binder to rabbitmq, Kafka settings. And minimum partition count four. All right, nice. Let's go ahead and start this. Ah, for some reason, my Mac is occasionally doing weird stuff on my task switching. OK, our sync is started, our processor is started. And let's go to our, we'll do this the hard way. We'll go to our source, and we'll start that. And then let's go check out what happens with our processor and our sync. So we start seeing these come through, right? As you would expect, which is working pretty well. Now, um, let's see, how much time? We're good. OK, awesome. Oh, that's all? That's plenty of time. We've got time. OK. so. Let's take this one step further, right? Because it would be really cool if we had a way to chain some of these functions together so we could do multiple transformations in one hop, if you will. Rabbit pun. Never mind. OK. Ah, tough crowd. All right. So um, what it would be really nice if we were able to do is fix this. Because right now, I see a problem with this. It's, it's not a bug, it's just a problem, because we're shipping out coffees that are both whole bean and ground, and I think we should be able to do better than that. So let's create another bean at bean, and we'll call this function fix it. And this also is a function that takes a flux. In this case, it'll take a flux of retail coffees and produce another flux of retail coffees, right? And let's see, function, and we'll do it dot map, so we'll take each of their values. Uh, here we go, so let's do, let's, let's see. Um, so it dot copy, and we'll take, uh, actually, ha, huh. so retail coffee, how do I want to do this? I could just do an it dot copy, right? Um, State equals whole bean. So that works. Now I'm going to go ahead and just um, add some. There we go. What's that? Oh, yeah. Um, yes, I am, actually. Hold on just a second. So our coffee. All right. So. Yes, that's fine, right? So we have a flux of retail coffees. We're mapping each value, uh, and we're copying that value to a new retail coffee. And then in between, we just want to uh, do an R coffee dot sout. Nope, sout. And there we go. And and then we can kill this. And let's go ahead and change this. Because now we need to add one other parameter here, our function definition. So Spring Cloud function definition, process it, and fix it, right? And actually, what I'm going to do is replace process it with both. And we'll just go ahead and drop that in, too. Oops. Spring Cloud stream function definition equals. Nice. Let's go ahead and restart that. Hopefully, I haven't done anything too crazy here. OK, that's a good sign. Let's go ahead and restart this. So it's really nice, because you can dynamically change these and chain these as you go as well. And now we're fixed. Everything is whole bean. 
Life is good. All right. Um, don't have time to do the uh, Kafka switch, switch over, but it is super simple. So if you want to know more about that, please hit my repo. If you want to know more about the evolving API, uh, about things, oh, I actually didn't uh, go so far as to also say that when I mentioned that this would be a flux, this will eventually also incorporate flows as well. So just some things to keep in mind. This is a, a very much under develop, development evolving API, but it's going in very good directions. So. All right, let's go back to here. We'll finish up, and then we'll get to the big announcements. All right, for more information, uh, here are the resources you can go to. My GitHub repo, Building Reactive Pipelines with Kotlin. Uh, obviously, the kotlinlang.org is a great uh, jumping off point for more information about Kotlin itself. Spring Cloud Stream site gives you a lot of information, docs, links to the GitHub repo. It's all open source, 100%. Uh, Project Reactor, if you want to know more about the reactive uh, streams initiative and, and library uh, that we're actually leading development on, uh, but is in widespread use. Uh, you can also reach me via email if you have any questions, comments, or feedback. Best way, though, is on Twitter. Uh, if, you don't, if you have questions, comments, or feedback that you don't want to share publicly, my DMs are open as well, so MK heck. And with that, please don't forget to vote. Thank you for coming, and let's stick around for the announcement.